Welcome again to Fort George. Uh, we come now to our congregational prayer. Uh, one of the things we've always done at our church uh, is pray for each other, and we want to continue doing that through this time. And so uh, if you want prayer, uh, please connect with the church, send us an email, uh, or give Pat Duncan a call. A few requests came in this week. Uh, the first one, uh, let's pray for those uh, traveling home from all over the world because of this coronavirus. I know several of you have family members in this situation. Uh, we also want to request, uh, we have a request from Jared and Kennedy, who had a baby this week. Uh, little baby Thomas uh, is, uh, had some health issues, and his heart and oxygen levels uh, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, they're now transferred down to Vancouver. And so let's pray for healing for Thomas and strength for Jared and Kennedy. Also, we want to pray for Guy, who's had a blood clot in his brain since a fall a couple of weeks ago. He's had several seizures over the last couple of days. He's on medication for this. He's going in for more tests. But let's pray for healing for him and peace for his family. Now, the good news is uh, Francine's recovered from her pneumonia. Now, Spencer is also down in Vancouver, or was down in Vancouver this week with his grandpa. Uh, he's just been given uh, comfort measures, and they're praying that he's actually going to pass quickly. Uh, Spencer's dad would love to be there, but uh, isn't, as he isn't uh, very well, so let's pray for him. Uh, finally, let's pray for Donna's brother-in-law. Uh, uh, his name's Joe. He had emergency surgery and has been sent to Toronto uh, uh, for some more surgery. Uh, his wife, Karen, can't go with him because of the new rules, and this is really hard on both of them. So let's pray for a successful surgery and peace for them. And also, let's keep praying for our city and for our healthcare workers and other frontline people uh, who are coming in contact with the virus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now and uh, we thank you that you're a provider, that you're aware of everything that's going on uh, in our world. Uh, this virus isn't news to you. Uh, we trust you and we're so thankful that uh, you, know, you are sovereign and in control. There's several things that are on our minds. Some of them have been brought before us this week. Uh, others of them have been left unsaid, and we bring these before you now, and we pray that uh, you would hear us, hear your children as we pray. We pray specifically uh, for uh, those traveling home with this, uh, in this situation because of this coronavirus, and we ask uh, that you be with them, uh, particularly family members and friends of, of our church here. And we pray also for Jared and Kennedy, who are down at Children's right now with Thomas. Uh, God, we pray for wisdom for those doctors as they deal with little Thomas uh, that his uh, breathing issue would, would strengthen and his heart would stop dipping down. Father, we pray for healing there in the name of Jesus. We also want to pray for Guy uh, and his blood clot. Uh, God, you know this situation. You know what's going on in his head. And uh, I pray for the doctors and the tests that he's undergoing right now, uh, for wisdom for them uh, and for healing for Guy that he could return to us quickly. We also pray for Spencer's family uh, as his grandpa is on uh, the verge of death. Uh, Lord, it's, it's tough to know exactly what to pray in this kind of situation, but uh, we ask for peace for the family, particularly for uh, Spencer's dad as he's unable to be down there with his dad uh, during this time. Uh, Lord Jesus, I, I pray uh, that you'll be close to them. Uh, Lord, that you'll use Spencer to be a blessing. Also, we pray for Donna's brother-in-law, Joe, uh, and his situation. God, we pray that uh, as he's in Toronto that you'll give wisdom to those doctors. And we pray also for his wife who can't be with him for peace in that situation. Lord Jesus, now as, as uh, this world is all in a state of chaos because of this virus, we ask for your hand and your mercy. And Lord, particularly, we pray for our city, for Prince George. And we pray a blessing on those frontline workers, our hospital staff and uh, the ambulance and police uh, officers who are involved really on the front lines here. And we pray, Lord Jesus, for your safety, your protection, and that you would stay your hand in this time. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've also uh, come now to a time of giving uh, and to our announcements. Uh, uh, giving is pretty different right now, but I want to encourage generosity in this time. Uh, while certainly we are saving money on uh, the coffee and cookies uh, after the service, uh, the other expenses at the church haven't diminished. So our missionaries, the other ministries that our church is involved in, these are still going forward and incurring expenses. So uh, I want to just give you a couple of options for giving. Uh, the first and the best option is uh, to scroll to the top of the page and click the giving link. Uh, so it's going to take you to another page. There's a big blue button there that says donate online. You can use a credit card uh, to either make a one-time donation or a recurring donation. This is what I do. It works great. 
Uh, the next way is to send a check, uh, or write a check out to Fort George Baptist Church. Uh, drop it in our mailbox at the church. Uh, these get picked up daily, but just please uh, do not put any cash in the mailbox. If you do want to give cash or debit, then you'll need to come into the office during office hours. All right, let me pray now for the giving, uh, but if you are going to give online, it's easiest actually to do that at the finish, uh, after you finish watching uh, these videos in order to not interrupt the playlist. But let's pray, uh, and after this we'll have two announcements. Heavenly Father, thank you for your provision for us, uh, for taking care of our needs, in, even in this time of great need. And so we ask now for uh, your blessing as we give back to you out of what you've given us. We love you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Hi everyone. I hope everyone is hanging in there during this difficult time. For those who don't know me, I'm Jeanette Weans from Fort George Baptist Church. I'm coordinating a new serving group called Diakonos. So now more than ever, we need to step up as the hands and feet of the church and serve others. I'm putting this message out there that we will need volunteers to help. Really, this applies to anyone and everyone in the church. I need people willing to make phone calls to check in with others and encourage them. People willing to do online orders or grocery store pickup for those that are vulnerable and can't leave the home. Um, and then people who might be willing to help with tech support. Everything will be done in a safe and hygienic way to prevent the spread and while still maintaining social distancing. We will start with gathering volunteers and I'm hoping that two or more people will come forward and help assisting with coordinating depending on how big the group grows. I'm hopeful we can serve people within our church, within our community and within our neighborhoods, especially during this time to help meet the needs of others physically, socially, mentally and spiritually. Please contact me through text or phone call at 250-961-3609 or JeanetteWeans at Hotmail.com. J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E-W-I-E-N-S. And even though it feels really scary right now and it's a really serious situation that we are facing, I really challenge people to be a light and an encouragement to others. Thank you. Bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Cheyenne and I've been with Lighthouse for since it began and <laughs> I'm here just to share with you a bit of what happened when I was in Uganda for the months of January and February. So I was serving with a church called Watoto and they have different church services all over the country really and um, they also take in orphans and widows and they care for them in orphanage systems and they have babies homes and everything so I went and I volunteered with them and the way that I got connected was they emailed me actually right after I had said just this prayer of faith where I said, God, I can't, I can't find a ministry to build into for um, an amount of time here in Canada or wherever it might be. So I asked him to bring something to me. And so just a couple days later, they emailed me and they said, oh, like here's our ministry and we think you'd really fit in and this is something that you could try out. So I said, okay, God, like this is where you're calling me. And so I went, um, there was, so many incredible things that he did there. Um, so I'll share two points of ministry that I mostly spent my time on. And so the first was in the baby's home. I worked there four days a week, um, caring for the babies and things. And one of the coolest things that God taught me right away was um, how he just cares about all these little details. And that came about because every Sunday, volunteers can bring a baby to church. And I saw this as an opportunity um, that I could use very purposefully and not just take an easy baby to church and enjoy it for myself. So I pray to God and say like, okay, so if this is the right decision, if I've chosen the right baby, um, just give me a sign. And the first thing that came to mind was to ask that their their outfit would like match mine, which is just a silly thing to ask, but that's what came to mind. So that's what I prayed. And sure enough, the first week I went down to pick up my baby to bring them to church and their outfit was perfectly color coordinated with mine. And I thought, okay, could be a coincidence, but also I prayed for this. So I went out and I went with that second week, I asked for it again, and sure enough, it happened. And so I was like, okay, this is not coincidence. And I didn't even pray for it the third week or the fourth or the fifth, but every single week that I was there, I would go to pick up my baby and bring them to church. And each time their outfit was somehow color coordinated to mine. And I thought that was funny. And it was, it was just a really silly and ridiculous way to showcase this, but really it taught me that God cares about the little details in our lives and he like even down to my interest in color coordination. Um, so that was one of the biggest things that came out of the baby's home. I'll speak about um, the second place that I focused my time, which is something I call my art ministry. So that's, I had a group of kids and I would bring my art supplies and we would do coloring and drawing and dancing. 
we prayed together and shared scripture and it was a really good time we got to know their families and everything um but there were also some crazy transformational things that happened so the first thing that happened was um i was hanging out with these kids at the very pond that i met them at um and so we were racing around doing laps and one of the kids had taken my glasses and she was running with them and i should have seen this coming but one of my lenses popped out landed in the pond and so that was like should have been devastating but the kids they knew for some reason that i wasn't worried they're like auntie cheyenne why aren't you worried why aren't you worried and so i told them oh like i'm not worried because of god and i remembered i had my bible with me so i pulled it out and i shared with them first peter 5 7 give all your worries and cares to the lord because he cares for you and we sat there we memorized it and i prayed with them and we just asked that god would help us find it and everything and sure enough later we found them and i got to show them like that god is faithful and that I don't have to be worried in those kind of situations and I saw how it really impacted some of them they had never even seen a bible um, and it was really cool um, and the second thing is there was these few kids um, who had a very troubled home life um, and their behavior was definitely a reflection of that so when I would go and do art with them they would push and shove and um, hoard all the pencil crayons and they didn't have very good manners so one day when I went down to visit them, I was just praying for those few specific kids that their heart would start to look more like Jesus and reflect who he is. And in my mind, I was thinking, this is only going to happen if if they really come to know Christ and God would transform them. But uh, you can't you can't put a title on or a time limit on how that kind of stuff happens. So I come down and just two minutes after this prayer is said, I give them my pencil crayons, we start drawing. And these three kids that had like, the most chaotic behavior I had ever seen where all of a sudden they had taken the art supplies and they were dishing them out and before they even took any for themselves they were making sure everyone had paper and pencil crayons and it was just out of nowhere and it still makes me quite speechless when I think about that and even since then like my entire stay they had had that kind of behavior and it was really cool um, um the art ministry was beautiful and um, some of the kids in the families left a huge impact on me, specifically those few kids with the poor behavior. When I came to know their mother, um, when I met her, she wasn't in a very good state. She was unemployed. Um, she doesn't know very much English. She couldn't even tell me her kids' ages. They didn't interact very much, and um, their life was just kind of idle and flat. Um, so I started taking care of them, and the kids were able to go to school finally. The kids... Um, they just got a new life to them and I wanted to see that for their mother as well. So I gave her a Bible um, and she was a practicing Muslim, but she was still interested in reading the Christian Bible because she thought like her God and my God are the same. So I was very excited. She was open to that. I brought her to church um, and I tell you like this woman, her eyes, they completely changed. Like her life became light, even though I hadn't even known if she opened the Bible, but she all of a sudden she was just filled with something more than she had had before. And it was really cool. Um, when I found that family, they had one piece of fruit about the size of a melon for the whole week. It was called a jackfruit, um, and that really broke my heart. But when I left, it was incredible to see. They had extra food. They were sharing with the neighbors and saying, praise Jesus. They were hugging and interacting. It was such a different community when I left, and I just, I'm so thankful that Jesus took that and allowed me to be a part of it, and it was, yeah, it was just so neat. Um, beyond everything that God transformed in that community, my heart and my point of view on things and my lifestyle really changed. And so I used to think like going out and doing these good works is like living your faith above and beyond and going the extra mile, but it's really not. It's it's just gotta be the bare minimum that we're asked to do really. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he prepared for us long ago. So he has prepared us to go and do them. And he's given us good works to do right here where we are. And so I'm not comfortable to just sit and live in my Bible, in my bubble and say like this, we should go and help these people and the hurting and everything and really do nothing about it. I didn't do anything about it much before because I knew like, where do I start? It's very overwhelming. But when I think about it, what I did in Uganda was very easy. It's so easy to give a toothbrush or shoes or whatever and show people that you love God because those are simple, but when I think of Canada, I ask myself, how can I fulfill this calling right here where we are? Because if we want to go help the hurting, we have to venture out into the homeless or the drug addicts or 
um, things that we aren't familiar with and seem a little more complicated. But I really do think Watoto Church does an amazing job of celebrating Christ and caring for community. So um, I just, I really want to continue that calling right here where I am. And please keep me accountable to that. But I also want to invite you to participate in it. Because um, the body of Christ has a responsibility no matter where you are, whether you are called to go somewhere else or whatever God puts in front of you. So if you want to do, say, street ministry, someone who I know that's really good to get connected with, his name is Rod Unger. He does street ministry in Prince George and actually different places in BC also. And right now he's putting together like a worship team and some things to go do on the street. So if you want to connect with him, find him on Facebook. His name is Rod Unger. Um, and if you just want to bless the community in this time of social distancing, you can even um, connect with people and help them when they are affected more than us. So a good person to connect with for that, her name is Jeanette, and um, I I'm sure they'll talk about that later in the service as well. So that's all I have time for right now. Thank you for listening. Um, if, I, if you want to see some pictures, I'll probably have some when we can socialize. So yeah, thank you. Welcome again to Lighthouse Fort George and our first video recorded sermon. Uh, I want to give some special thanks to those who've helped pull this off this week. It was a big job. And I also want to ask for your patience as we get the hang of this. Uh, please know, uh, let us know about any glitches that uh, you experience while trying to watch. So the medium's a bit different. Uh, we're all sitting in our homes instead of gathering together at church. Uh, many of us are just by ourselves or just with family members. Uh, some of you have invited others over from church to watch with you. Thank you for doing that. And I'm sure this all feels just a bit surreal. Uh, it's certainly surreal for me. I get to watch church with you all this weekend. Uh, too bad we couldn't find a better speaker. So anyway, the medium's different, but the message is the same. Jesus has this. Even though the world is quite literally coming apart at the seams, he's in control. That's the message of the Bible, and actually that's very much the message of Revelation. If you're just tuning in with us this week, uh, we've been in a very timely series through Revelation. Uh, the revelation that Jesus gave to the Apostle John while he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos in about 96 AD. And today we're in the first ten verses in chapter 19. So please uh, go ahead, grab your Bibles, and follow along. Revelation chapter 19. And we're getting actually close to the end now. We're beginning the homeward stretch of the journey, and actually it's not just because there's only four more chapters, but because at this point in the text, the anticipation begins to build really quickly. So if you're able, would you stand with me as we read Revelation 19, 1 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He's avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried out, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord our, our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it's the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. These are the words of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, as we read that, you probably noticed the word hallelujah. 
Uh, hallelujah is one of those words that everybody's heard, uh, whether you go to church or not. Uh, Leonard Cohen sings about it. Uh, Coldplay sings it. It's one of those words that has just this really nice ring to it, even though most people don't necessarily know what it means. Turns out it's a Hebrew word. It means you praise God. Hallelujah is you praise, and Ja or Ya is God, or it's actually the short for Yahweh. Now in King James, then it's praise ye the Lord. And it pops up four times in this text, and it sits at the very center of what this passage is about because it uh, points to two celebrations or feasts that tell us that the end is near. The end of everything is near. Now, any first century Jew would have recognized uh, this word and uh, that it was pointing to the feast of Passover. Uh, of course, none of us are first century Jews, and so... Uh, uh, that might have gone over your head. It certainly did mine until I started studying this. You see, what I didn't realize on my first read-through was that this word is just totally out of place here. And that's because it's an Old Testament word. It's a Hebrew word here written in the Greek. That's not a New Testament word. And in fact, these, uh, these ten verses are the only place in the New Testament where this is used. But it's, it pops up all over the Psalms, and particularly in Psalms 113 to 118. And those are called the Halal Psalms, or the Hallelujah Psalms. And, and these Psalms were special because they were sung at Passover. So people would sing them as they were uh, celebrating the Passover feast, which was all about, as you remember, uh, how God had delivered them from Egypt. This is what Jesus would have sung with his disciples after they finished eating the Last Supper. Now here's the connection to Revelation 19. In uh, chapter 17 and 18, John was describing the fall of Babylon. and We talked about that last week. And, and so it's appropriate to sing hallelujah here because God's people are being delivered. So God's bringing them up now out of Babylon and into the city of God. And this is what happens at the end. So it's like a new Passover celebration or a new exodus out of Babylon and into life with God. And everyone who gets invited to the feast, it says in verse 9, is blessed. You want to get invited here. That's the first feast that's pointed to with this word, hallelujah. But there's another. The second feast that's being alluded to here is actually a typical Jewish wedding festival. And we know this, actually, because John calls this the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so, throughout the Old Testament, uh, the arrival of God's kingdom is actually spoken out, uh, about in this way. And so people uh, are entering into this great wedding feast. And so, for example, uh, Isaiah tells us this. Uh, in Jerusalem, the Lord of Heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It'll be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meats. That sounds awesome. I mean, especially since Prince George is going to be eating mostly toilet paper for the next few weeks. But what's even more relevant is that Jesus picks this idea up in one of his parables, uh, the parable of the marriage feast. And we get that one in Matthew 22. And so uh, Jesus starts uh, this parable saying that the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated uh, by uh, the story of a king who is preparing a great wedding feast for his son. And here uh, Jesus is talking about his father and himself. And so he says, hey, one day the father is going to throw a big party because I'm going to get married. That's going to be a celebration. And this is what Jesus is alluding to here in Revelation 19. And so the multitude cries out, verse 6, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. You see, the dragon tried to topple him and failed. The beasts have sought to undermine him and failed. The great king reigns unstoppable. And now the wedding party of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The time is here. So the imagery we get here then would be this combination between these two feasts, between Passover and a Jewish wedding. Now here's the point. Yes, this is talking about the future return of Christ. One day, Jesus is coming back. But uh, Jesus and the Bible aren't saying, uh, hey, you know, look into this crystal ball and know the future. Figure out when this is going to happen. You know, isn't that interesting? Aren't you learning some interesting stuff? 
No, the Bible doesn't care about teaching us interesting stuff, and neither does Jesus. He tells us this because he wants us to do something right now. He wants us to be disciples. And I think this makes sense, since Jesus' great commission doesn't say, you know, go figure out what's going to happen in the future. That's not what the Bible's about. It says, go and make disciples of all nat nations. I teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so, a following Jesus is about being a disciple and making more disciples. This is what Revelation's uh, about as well. I've been talking about that. So it's asking us then, which city are we going to live towards? Excuse me. Are we going to orient ourselves uh, towards the harlot, who we talked about last week, or towards the bride? Now, the picture of God's people being his bride is actually not new here either. It shows up throughout Revelation as well as all over Scripture. And so, uh, for example, uh, if you remember back to the beginning of Revelation, when Jesus is writing those letters to the church, he says to Ephesus, uh, and he's got a complaint about them, and he says this, Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love that you had at first. That's if he, uh, Revelation 2, verse 4. So what's... Jesus saying here? Well, he's saying, you know, hey, uh, Ephesians, you got all sorts of great programs at your church. You know, church is going great, but you're not in love with me anymore. And that matters to Jesus because Jesus wants a bride. The Old Testament's full of this as well. And so in Isaiah, we read, for example, a fear not, for your creator will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. For the Lord has called you back from your grief as though you were a young wife. There's this marriage imagery. He, God loves us. He, he's speaking tenderly to us. But then look at how uh, God responds when his people began uh, to center their lives on other things in, instead of on him. He says this, How can I pardon you? For even your children have turned against me. They have sworn by gods that are not gods at all. I fed my people until they were full, but they thanked me by committing adultery and lining up at the brothels. They're well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. Shouldn't I punish them for this, says the Lord? Should I not avenge myself against such a nation? That's Jeremiah 5. Do you see how, how the language there that God uses to describe his relationship uh, with us is, is language of marriage. So when we turn from him, then he sees this as adultery as well. Strong language. And then the New Testament actually takes this language and applies it to Jesus and the church. And this is huge. This is the New Testament claiming Jesus is God. And there's tons of passages that I could give you on this. I'm just going to give you one. Paul says... Uh, this is Ephesians 5, uh, 25 and following. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Here's the point. God's people, Old and New Testament, are the bride of Christ. Now, Take that with you, this, this picture, and I want to unpack some of the marriage customs of first century Judaism so we can actually appreciate Revelation 19. This is where it comes alive. So here we go. So there's three steps to getting married in the first century. Uh, there was the engagement, which was called the betrothal. Uh, there was the preparation for the wedding. And then there was the wedding feast itself. And so the betrothal would begin with the uh, prospective groom uh, leaving his father's house and traveling with his best man to the prospective bride's house. And there, uh, he'd make a deal with the bride's father. Now, resist the temptation to be repulsed at how uh, backward this is compared to 21st century women's liberation. This was culture. But what I want you to see is the parallel to what Christ has done for us. So in particular, uh, the groom and the father-in-law would agree on the dowry. In the first century, a wife was bought with a price. Now, as soon as that price was paid, 
the marriage was legal. They were husband and wife. But they actually wouldn't live together for a long time yet. Instead, they'd be consecrated to each other or set apart for each other from that time forward. And, and a new covenant would be established between them, which would be sealed by the drinking of a cup of wine, over which they would say, this cup is a new covenant. Now, nobody here or watching this is a first century Jew, but if you've been around church, this language should start to sound a little bit familiar. This is communion language. All right, uh, at the, this point, the groom then leaves the bride's house, leaves her there, and he returns to his father's house. And actually, the couple would avoid seeing each other for the duration of the betrothal. And actually, many betrothals would last up to a year. Now, try to reconcile that with dating culture today. And during this time, uh, the groom would actually be preparing a room for the bride in his father's house. So he, he's literally building an addition on the back of dad's house. Uh, there were millennials back then too, so we're not moving out, we're staying here. Anyway, uh, at the same time, the bride would be repairing, preparing herself for the wedding. But they wouldn't see each other, and while they wouldn't see each other, they were still legally bound to each other, as such that if their relationship would break down at this point, it'd be considered a divorce. And any other relationship that a person would enter into at this point would be adultery. That's betrothal. At the end of the betrothal period, the bridegroom, dressed in his festive clothing and accompanied by his best man and friends, would make his way back to the bride's house. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. They'd let the, bride, uh, the bride's family know roughly when this was going to happen so they could be ready, but they wouldn't disclose the exact day or hour. In fact, in order to add an element of surprise here, he'd often arrive at midnight. How'd you like that? And his arrival would be announced by a shout. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. And the bride would put on a veil and be accompanied by her maidens and, and she'd be, they'd be carrying lamps and they'd come out uh, to him. And uh, then he would actually take her, take his wife, back to his father's house. This is why some uh, traditions talk about taking a wife for yourself. And so he'd take her then back to his father's house and his father would have a feast ready for them, the wedding supper, uh, and it would last sometimes 7 to 14 days. Imagine the tab on that party. All right, now jump with me to the day of Jesus' arrest. He's in the upper room with his disciples. He's having the last supper. Uh, they've already broken bread and he's passed the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. That's already happened. And then he says this to them. This is out of John 14, uh, verses 1 to 3. He says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's the husband. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. He, he's paid the purchase price and sealed the engagement with a cup of wine. And now he's preparing a place for us so that he can come back and take us to the Father's house. This is why everyone in Revelation 19 is shouting, Hallelujah, let's celebrate. It's because the time has come for the marriage feast. And so in verse 7 it says, Let us rejoice and be glad, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now, this is the day that we're looking forward to, the day when Jesus comes back. But what do we do with this today? What does the text call us to? I want to leave us with three things today. First, if you're someone who's pledged yourself to Jesus, then you can have confidence. You can live in the confidence that Jesus loves you. The Lamb loves you. Throughout Scripture, Jesus says some incredible things about us. He calls us friends. He calls us sisters and brothers. He even calls us children of God. These are intimate expressions. But here the metaphor is even more powerful. Jesus loves His church as His bride. 
If you're married today, do you remember the days and the weeks leading up to your wedding? Do you remember how you longed for that day to arrive? I remember one night I was sleeping and I had a dream that I was lying beside my bride-to-be. And I rolled over to give her a hug and I just kind of flailed my arm out like this and actually smashed the wall so hard that I had to turn the lights on to make sure I hadn't put a hole in it. Friends, Jesus longs to be united with his bride. He longs for you. Just a note here. Uh, what if you aren't sure that you're part of the bride yet? What if you haven't been betrothed to Jesus yet? If this is you, then pray, you know, Jesus, I accept your purchase price on my behalf. Thank you for dying for me, a sinner. I, I need a Savior. And so now I choose to live for your glory. Help me do this. Help me by your Spirit living inside me to prepare myself for your return. If you pray that and give yourself to living for his return, then you are part of his bride. So first, we can have great confidence that Jesus loves us. Second, since we're betrothed to the Lamb, following Jesus today, or we call that discipleship, is primarily about loyalty. It's an issue of faithfulness. We don't want to be found cheating with another lover when he returns. And Babylon's out there seeking to seduce us. She's a harlot. And we looked at her last week and she's powerful and seductive. And she wants to deceive us into thinking that we can have her now while we're engaged to the Lamb. We can worship Jesus and live for the pleasures of this world too. But that's Satan's lie. And when you put it that way, doesn't it sound ridiculous? You can't be engaged to two people. You can either have the harlot or the bride. One hates you and just wants to use you. The other loves you so much that he gave his life for you. So which one are you going to orient your life towards? Finally, the call is for us to be ready. The bridegroom has gone away to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back. It's going to be soon. But we don't know the day or the hour, so prepare yourself today. Pursue holiness. Live in a way that you know would please him, and so that when he returns, he will find his bride wearing fine linen, bright and clean. Give yourself to living for Jesus, because hallelujah, we're getting hitched. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you that you are coming back and that you have made us to be a bride. And you want us to be holy and pure for you. Jesus, I, I pray that you put conviction in our hearts now, that, that we would uh, want to live, uh, want to leave behind uh, Babylon, uh, the harlot, and live for the Lamb. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, Dan here, pastor at Lighthouse Fort George. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope this service was a blessing for you. If you want to know more about starting a relationship with Jesus or you want some more information about our church, please send an email to fortgeorgebaptist at gmail.com. Also, if you're a regular member here or this service blessed you, we want to encourage you to consider donating using the giving link at the top of the page. God bless you and have a great week.